Thank you. Um, the gene revolution. I've given this, oh my goodness, the seconds go fast. Um, <laughs> sorry, I have this on the monitor here, I'm not used to it. Imagine, imagine agriculture. If you're a farmer, you take risks. And one thing that you have to deal with is weeds. The weeds are overwhelming. Weed management is the number one preoccupation of the farmers, at least in, in, in the developed world, industrial agriculture. 80% of all the pesticides that we use in agriculture are herbicides. That's how important the weeds are. Imagine that a company comes with the magic herbicide. A magic herbicide. How does this work? <laughs> Got it. A magic herbicide that's basically like water. It is safe, it is innocuous, it does not affect the environment, it is absolutely safe to humans, to animals, to the soil. You don't worry about your weeds anymore. You just plant your crops, never mind the weeds, and when you're ready or whenever you want, whether you're a gardener or a farmer, you just spray that stuff, the water, and all your weeds disappear. And your vegetables in your garden are still standing, and your crops are there. It's magic. And the same company comes and they invent the magic insecticide, again. You don't have to worry about pests. The insecticide is built in your crop. You don't even need to spray anymore. These two technologies, HT stands for herbicide tolerance. BT is the name of bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis. And these two technologies have been invented in the last 25 years. They have completely taken over agriculture. This chart shows you that over 90% of soybean grown in North America and in other countries in the world is now engineered to be herbicide tolerant. 80%, over 80% of the corn is also herbicide tolerant. And canola and sugar beets and all the big crops have now been engineered to be herbicide tolerant. And the BT is only 20% of that, but it's still significant. It's a major coup. It's a revolution in agriculture. And all the farmers have adopted it, obviously, because it is so magic. It has simplified their life. And there's very little risk anymore with, with weeds. 25 years ago, and I was part of that, 25 years ago, when the technology became important, it was, a, it was like a green technology. It was going to allow us to perform miracles, to have plants resistant to insects, to nematodes, and to do many other things that were really quite significant. And at the time, because it was somewhat green, at the time the concept of substantial equivalence was put forward. Basically, the technology involves just taking a gene from an organism. It could be a bacteria or a fish, or it doesn't matter where from. You take a gene, you take a piece of DNA, and DNA is absolutely not toxic. Take a piece of DNA and you put it in the plants, and you grow the crops, and the magic happens. And that's substantial equivalence. It is corn, it is engineered, it expresses a gene from a bacteria, but it does look like corn, it tastes like corn, and there's no difference. It is substantially equivalent. So the engineered crops were basically registered to be commercialized without really being tested, because nobody expected any problems. But more and more over the last 10 to 15 years, there's been some evidence building up, and it's, re it's really building up rather fast in the last few years, that there are some problems, there are some difficulties, there are some dark clouds. 
One of them is super weeds. Probably most of you have heard of that. The super weeds are basically weeds. They're regular weeds. They look like normal. They look normal weeds. They, they, don't, they don't grow giant or anything like that. <laughs> but they have evolved to become resistant to the technology so that the magic herbicide is not working anymore. It has lost its oomph. It has lost its magic. The weeds have become resistant. And so now the farmers are stuck with this technology, which is not quite performing. And right now, today, there are 38 species of weeds that are resistant in North America, and half of the acreage in the USA is now infested with these weeds. And the magic doesn't work anymore. The farmers have to pull the weeds by hand or use other herbicides, and I'll come to that. Same thing with the insecticide. Again, the magic doesn't work. The insects have become resistant. Not as fast as the weeds, and it's still growing, and it's growing very fast. And we don't have them here in BC, but it's growing all over North America and other parts in the world. It appeared in India on uh, engineered cotton, the first ones. Another problem is contamination contamination of the environment. Basically, uh, uh, farming used to be that if I was a farmer and you were a farmer and my cattle went into your field to eat your crop, it was my responsibility to bring them back in and to fence them in. Not so anymore. If I'm growing genetically engineered corn and you are an organic grower or a conventional grower and your field of corn is next to mine, you can be sure that the pollen, engineered pollen, is blowing into yours, contaminating your crops. And that has created problems. In Canada, we have lost our flax export and we have lost our canola export to the European Union because of that. There are also some difficulties with genetic pollution. I call it genetic pollution. I haven't seen it written that um, anywhere else, but it is genetic pollution. Basically, the transgenes, the genes that are uh, engineered into the crop, into the plants, they can move. Bacteria move genes between themselves. It's called lateral transfer, lateral gene transfer. Vertical gene transfer is sex. You give your genes to your children. Lateral gene transfer is you give your genes to the person sitting next to you. And bacteria do it all the time. And so it is probable, it is highly probable that the genes, the engineered genes in those crops will find their way into the soil and into the bacteria. It is also demonstrated that if you eat engineered corn or engineered soy, the transgenes will show up into the guts, into your bacterial guts, the guts in your bacteria, uh, the bacteria in your guts. <laughs> Sorry. There is a survey that was done in China, and that was published last year. The Chinese looked for antibiotic resistance in bacteria in the rivers in China. They sampled six rivers, multiple samples. They found antibiotic resistance bacteria in every river they sampled. With the antibiotic resistance came from synthetic genes, genes that were either came from a lab or from local engineered crops. It is not known. But the antibiotic resistance is very real. And the medical community is very worried that, and we should all be very worried, that we are losing antibiotics because of building up of antibiotic resistance in the bacterial populations. So it's not just CAFOs that are responsible. Apparently, the engineered crops also could be responsible. And then there are two other aspects, two other difficulties that show up. The crops, the en engineered crops, also contain allergens and toxic proteins. And I'm going to come back to this in a little bit more detail, because this is actually quite alarming. There's a lot of research that has been done in the last 20 years on engineered crops, on genetic engineering. And there is basically 
two different kinds of research. There's a research that being paid for by the biotech industry, one way or another. It can be a direct grant or indirect. I'm not going to go into the details. But a lot of academics are doing research basically sponsored by the biotech industry. And then there's a lot of research also done mostly in foreign countries in Europe by foreign uh, uh, country uh, agencies um, and uh, foreign universities. And somehow it is quite remarkable that most or if not all of the research done sponsored by the biotech industry shows that the technology is completely innocuous and very safe. And most, if not all, of the research done elsewhere shows that there are serious problems and this technology should be thoroughly reviewed and tested before it is put on the grocery shelves. In 1996, the scientists of the Food and Drug Administration, 1996 is the first year when the crops were commercialized by Monsanto. And the FDA scientists were all in agreement that the engineered crop could or would bring allergenicity, toxic proteins, nutrient deficiencies, and other problems. That's documented, that's published. Two years later, I was in Edinburgh in Scotland for a conference, a nematology conference. And during the conference, there was a bit of brouhaha. There was a scientist in Scotland who had come out on TV, and he had been doing toxicity tests. He had seen that his rats, he had fed rats um, uh, potatoes, engineered potatoes, and, his, and for, he had done that for several months. And, and after several months, he looked in, inside to see what he found, to see the, what the effect could be. And he found very alarming results. He found definitely damage to organs. He found damage to the intestine. He found damage to the kidneys, to the liver, to the brain, and the testicles. He was very alarmed. He went on TV to talk to the public about it, and that created quite a scandal. He paid dearly for it because it's a sin. It's, an ori it's a, a, a mortal sin for a scientist to talk about his research before it is peer-reviewed and published. He was, he was fired the next day. Government experts were hired because there was a huge uproar in the uh, scientific community. My goodness, time is going fast. I have to speed up. Um, there was a, a bit of a scandal. He, his research was shown to be, by experts, was shown to be lacking. And he was given back his papers because his lab has been closed and his, uh, his papers confiscated. And he went on to publish, and he published his result in, this is Dr. Aparat Pushta, uh, from uh, the Rote Institute in Scotland. He published his results in one of the best uh, medical journals in the world, The Lancet. That was the first alarm bells about the technology. And there's been many since. In 2002, um, 10 years ago, there was the completion of the um, genome project. And the genome project showed that we had, we function as human beings with 100,000 genes, 100,000 proteins or so. And the genome project, to everybody's surprise, announced that we only have less than 25,000 genes. Every gene codes for more than one protein. That means that the rest of the DNA, the 95% of the DNA that are not coding, are full of regulatory sequences that actually tell the gene what protein to make. And we don't know how that works. Every gene makes several proteins, many, some of them many proteins, according to the weather, according to the environment of the cell. And we really don't have a clue as to how that works. What we know is that basically in the engineered crops, there are many, many proteins that are created and we really don't know what they are. They are treated by the biotech industry and the government agencies and many other scientists. They are treated as background noise and they are there. And, and, and we're just waking up to this problem. 
This is a Western blot. It shows you that there are many proteins where there should be only one. The research of scientists of the Food and Drug Administration in 1996 predicted allergies. And since then, there have been many publications showing allergies. Allergies to Bt proteins in mice, Bt corn, soybean, same thing. They showed also, um, the, 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 the publication also shows toxic toxicity of the anginate crops to mice and rats. And this is published, there's dozens and dozens and dozens of publications, peer-reviewed in very serious publications. Organ damage. So, I don't know what the future of agriculture is, and I don't know what the future of the gene revolution is, but I am very concerned, and that's why I'm here. One thing that is happening, I talked about the super weeds. Well, the chemical industry, the biotech industry, used to be chemical industries. The chemical industry is basically responding to that by saying, well, we have what you need. You need another herbicide, so here, instead of using instead of using uh, Roundup, you're going to use 2,4-D and decombat. There, there, and we have magic herbicides again, and how many years will it be before that fails? And by the way, there are several publications, quite a few publications in the last few years, that are showing that uh, Roundup, the glyphosate, the uh, active ingredient in Roundup is actually not water, it's not innocuous at all. It is a very insidious, a very slow. Roundup is a chelator. It holds uh, metals. And proteins, many proteins, need metals to work. And Roundup, or glyphosate, is stealing that. And the, the proteins are not working. And it's a slow process, and it's very insidious. So this is um, the status of genetic engineering today. Um, I'm not sure how it's going. I, my conclusion would be that the future of agriculture is not necessarily engineered. Thank you. Mm -hmm.